Okay, so good afternoon everyone. Since we have already studied the history of swimming, let's go on learning the biomechanics of swimming. <laughs> Do you want to know? The best swimmers have the best innate understanding of hydrodynamics. Swimming is all about drag management. We want to be able to make our bodies as long and slender as possible so that drag doesn't hinder us. With freestyle, for example, I've been trying to get better at decreasing my frontal profile. And what that means is I used to extend forward um, with there being a pretty big gap between my shoulder and my jaw. And now I try to make sure that my head is a little further forward and my shoulder is extended so that this whole surface is no longer a drag area. Just very small things like that that you would normally never think of, but they make a big difference over the course of a race. Once you get to this level, you know, once you're an Olympian, it's very, very hard to get better. And so we're constantly looking for very little things that maybe we can tweak that somebody else might not see that's from, you know, Russia or Australia. We're always trying to stay like one step ahead of the world. Before 2011 even, I was, I was swimming with disconnections. So I thought about my kick, having a really strong kick. I thought about my arms. I didn't think of everything as one unit. Once I found that connection, it really took me to a whole new level. A really important part is, is timing the correct kick to a particular movement in your stroke. When you're swimming a butterfly kick, a lot of us are only kicking down and then our feet are sort of floating up. The best people in the world are kicking up and down and so you're getting propulsion from both. In freestyle, for instance, at the top of your stroke, the first thing you want to do when you catch is, is kick with that same leg, but you need to be able to transfer that energy and that momentum through your hips, through your core, into your shoulders. You have to stay connected through your whole body from your head to your core, all the way to pointing your feet when you're kicking. It looks very smooth and rhythmic, but I flex my abs almost as hard as I can and use my core as leverage swimming from side to side. You have to work on your core because all the strokes basically start from the core. Rocket calls it the canoe, where I just set my anchor and then twist my core and use that leverage to pull, just really using my whole body. We're always changing up little stroke techniques to try and become a faster swimmer. For me, it's just instead of keeping my hands closed, keeping my hands a little open, you actually pull more water when your hands are a little bit open in your swimming stroke. It takes countless hours of hard work and dedication, a lot of commitment and a lot of sacrifices. You need to be willing to go that extra mile. It's so easy to just show up to practice or show up in the weight room and go through the motions, but if you're truly invested and you know that's what you want to do, that's what makes you champion. The Biomechanical Principles of Swimming Biomechanics studies the mechanical movements of living organisms. The biomechanical research of movements is extremely important in swimming. Indispensable for top-level competition sports, some principles are also helpful in teaching elementary level swimming. Knowledge of the principles of physics and biomechanics not only helps in developing the right technique, but also in its teaching. In polishing the swimming technique and correcting flaws, knowledge of certain principles is essential as this is how we understand the cause of the error so that we can fix it. If the swimmer's leg sways to right or to left in freestyle or backstroke swimming, this has a simple physical explanation. Newton provides the answer. In case that someone keeps swimming into the ropes, the solution should be found in the arm movement in the biomechanics of pulling or pushing. There is a number of simple physical items which affects the swimmer's performance. Various forces act on a body immersed in water. The body is under pressure from all directions, bottom, top, and sides. The reason for this is that the layers of fluid situated over each other press down on those below due to their weight. This is called a hydrostatic pressure. Downward weight is forced is exerted on the immersed swimmer and buoyancy in the opposite direction. As a result of the hydrostatic pressure force, buoyancy is obtained, which, according to Archimedes' principle, equals the weight of fluid displaced by the swimmer. A swimmer with a lower density has a greater buoyancy, thus it easier floats in water, has better posture on water. Density can be changed especially by breathing in. For favorable posture in water, 
Swimmers with great vital lung capacity do not blow out air in the short run. Thus, buoyancy will be more favorable. If the swimmer's density is lighter than water, example less than 1 gram per cubic centimeter, the swimmer floats on water, able to stay on the surface without much effort. In case of greater density, it will sink deeper. Swimming will be less effective because part of the propulsion is used up on staying afloat. The swimmer's density will depend on the density of the tissues. So, it matters what the body composition of the swimmer is. Density of the tissues is different. Bone tissue has the highest density. The muscle has a smaller and the fat has the smallest. With changing of age, an asymmetry occurs on the quantity of tissues. Beside, the helping aid of buoyancy will be determined by two main forces. One is propulsion, which means a propelling force, and the other is resistance, meaning a retaining or retracting force. While swimming, we are trying to advance ourselves in the water with our hands and legs, while our progress is slowed down by the water. As we encounter the water's resistance, the science of hydrodynamics deals with this subject in greater depth. With propulsion Newton's third law of motion, the law of action and reaction must be mentioned. The law of action and reaction states that every action has its equal reaction of the same force in the opposite direction. All this means that if a swimmer moves the water backwards with their arms and legs, they will move forward with the same force. In case of effective propulsion, the driving force approximately dr derives from the work of Hans in 56 to 57% of the forearm in 28 to 29 percent and of the work of legs in 15 percent. The efficiency of propulsion force in turn depends largely on the length of the arm stroke. This means the distance covered by the hand during an underwater arm stroke. In technical terminology this is called tempo length. The tempo length of professional swimmers is approximately 2.5 meters. If the swimmer wants to swim faster it's not the number of strokes that should be increased, but the tempo length should be evenly maintained. If a beginner swimmer moves the arms twice as fast as before, the resistance will increase fourfold. The hurried arm stroke will lead to the shortening of tempo length, deterioration of the technique, and the loss of swimming rhythm. It is important to understand buoyancy and relative density when learning how to swim. A basic understanding of this is a crucial element of overcoming a fear of water. Floating is a characteristic of the human body, and some of us have good buoyancy while others do not. It's all down to our relative density. In other words, how dense our body structure is compared to the density of the water we are attempting to float in. Fresh water has a density of 1 gram per cubic centimeter. However, salt water has a density of 1.024 gram per cubic centimeter, therefore having a higher density compared to fresh water. The average male has a density of 0 0.98 gram per cubic centimeter, and the average female is 0 0.97 gram per cubic centimeter. We can deduce, therefore, that most human beings will float to a certain degree with a small amount of the body staying above the water surface. Females float better than males, and both males and females float better in salt water than in fresh water. Other factors that affect flotation are the volume of air in the lungs, an individual's muscle-to-fat ratio, and the shape of the individual and therefore the location of their center of gravity. Types of resistance. The first one, we have drag or frontal resistance. Swimmers are embedded by the medium in which they are moving. With a particular strength, resistance is exerted against displacement. This is called a drag. The loss of flow determines the impact of resistance. Of the resistances, this is the resistance that holds back the swimmer the most. For example, if a fast swimmer raises his head due to the unfavorable posture of raising the head and sinking the torso, the resistance is increased by 20 to 35%. The second one, we have wave resistance. 
The retentive force due to the unevenness of water surface is called wave resistance. The water piles up in front of the swimmer and forms a throw behind for this reason forming a wave system. At higher speed, the resistance forming in front of the swimmer will be significant. The third one, we have skin friction or frictional resistance. Friction occurs between the body and the liquid or water particles. The liquid clings to the moving body, so swimmers carry a lot of water molecules with them along their bodies. The last type, we have the rare suction power or vortex resistance. When moving, swimming in water, vortices are formed. These vortices slow down the swimmer. Hydrodynamics research shows that at the higher speeds behind the body, there is strong vortex formation, which is approximately proportional with the fluid density and the square of the velocity. The importance of steady speed. We mentioned earlier the steady speed, which is an important factor in determining performance. Let us illustrate its importance with a simple example. When we drive in the city, the car consumes more petrol than if we evenly drove on the highway with a speed of 50 km per hour. Why? Because we slow down traffic light after traffic light, stop, accelerate, and continue in this manner. When we set off and accelerate from 0 to 50 km per hour, our vehicle eats more than if we were to keep a steady speed. The same applies with swimmers. Accelerating requires more energy than maintaining a steady speed. Consequently, to save energy, swimmers strive to advance at a steady speed. Okay, so that's it for today. I hope you learned something and thank you for listening. If you have questions regarding on the topic, you can ask that one on the comment section. Do you want to know?